Hello, my name is Paul, and I am in the H14 clinical section. And my two peer review articles were about, um, the first one was about how therapeutic communication uh, can be used to facilitate the lowering of barriers that patients, and uh, this article mentions specifically uh, mentally ill patients, um, how it can break down those barriers that patients place up uh, when they're talking to healthcare workers, and we all know that um, people lie to healthcare workers. Uh, they'll tell one person that they have something going on, and they'll tell the other person they don't have it going on. So this isn't specific to mental ill patients, but the article that I pulled up is. Um, and then my second one was about how group therapy affected patients that had a severe mental illness. Um, so therapeutic communication is something that I'm pretty sure most of us have experienced at this point. You know, whether you're, you were in the 120 group last year, last semester, or if you're transitioning, um, we've all talked to patients. Um, so we all have experience with therapeutic communication in some way, shape, or form. Um, however, I know that myself, I don't have much experience dealing with mentally ill clients. Um, I've had a couple that have Alzheimer's or dementia, but I haven't had a patient that was considered a, like their admitting diagnosis wasn't something to deal with their mental illness. So um, I thought that that would be a really good thing to look into. And as far as group therapy, I pretty much have no experience with group therapy. Um, all of my patient care has been one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the closest thing to a group that I've had is like their family being in there. And that's not exactly the same thing as what we're talking about here, what this article is talking about, or what we're going to be doing when we get on to the South Strand um, clinical day. Um, so I figured those would be two pretty good places to start. Um, and uh, so I'm going to talk about my two articles a little bit and just hopefully at the end I'm going to wrap it up and be able to uh, relate them back to the um, activities that I have planned um, and hopefully they'll enjoy the activities that I've come up with and uh, we can have a good day um, at South Strand. So, um, Next to me, I have my computer, and I'm just going to go through, and I'm going to kind of just read a little bit out of the abstract. I'm not going to read through these articles because um, one of them is 10 pages, and this other one is 9 pages. So there's a lot of stuff in there that doesn't really pertain to us. So I'm just going to read a little bit about each one of these out of the abstract and, and talk a little bit about it. And then I'm going to be, uh, at the end, I'm just going to talk about how each one of these influenced the idea that I had for my activities. Um, so the first one is barriers and facilitators of effective health education targeting people with mental illness. Um, and in the abstract, the background says, health education is particularly important for people with mental illness because they are at higher risk of becoming overweight or obese, developing type two uh, diabetes, um, <clears throat> are more at, at our are at a higher risk of becoming overweight and developing type 2 diabetes than members of the general population. However, little is known about how to provide health education activities that promote engagement and motivation among people with mental illness. So basically it's just saying that people have a hard time teaching mentally ill clients about their own health education. And this article goes into talking about how therapeutic communication can be used to facilitate educating these clients, educating these patients. You know, we all know that our main job as nurses is going to be to educate people. And we have to know how to educate all people, not just people that are mentally stable. We have to be able to educate people that are mentally impaired or mentally ill. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to skip down to the results. 
um, barriers to flow included, number one, information overload, particularly, uh, particularly of biomedical rationales for behavior change. So it was just a little too much for them. They had a hard time understanding it. Um, two, a one-size-fits-all approach that failed to address the needs and preferences of the target group. And three, one-way communication allowing little time for reflection. Educators promoted a state of flow when they spoke less and acted outside of a traditional expert role, thus engaging participants in the activity. Flow was facilitated when educators were attentive and responsive to the people with mental illnesses and when they stimulated reflection about health and health behavior through open-ended questions, communication tools, and in small group exercises. And that small group exercises is going to come into play when I talk more about the activities that I have planned. Um, so in conclusion, this study suggested that more focus needs to be paid on uh, the training of educators in terms of their skills to involve and engage people with mental illness in their own health education. So, and that's really important to us, because like I said, and like we all know, our, one of our biggest jobs as nurses is educating patients. So, this is talking about how important it is that we are trained properly to be able to convey this information to these patients that might have a harder time understanding it. And then next, my other article, Exploration of Experiences in Therapeutic Groups for Patients with Severe Mental Illness. So, basically in this article, they took groups of patients and they had patients of all different mental illnesses. Um, they had schizophrenia, delusional disorder, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, eating disorder and personality disorders and they had all of these groups take place in activities and these activities included different things um, and they were broken up into 90 minute segments um, some of the groups included psychosocial rehabilitation groups um, and they had more of a practical focus whilst pursuing the improvement of patients cognitive and social skills so with this they would um, do group readings and they would read aloud and it would enhance their social skills. Uh, they would have a psychoeducational group, which was known as their wellness group, and it provided patients with information about their psychiatric disorders, their pharmacological treatments, and healthy living lifestyles. And that goes back to the first article where we were talking about educators needing to know how to convey this information, and these groups were doing that. Um, and then they had expressive groups, which gave patients the opportunity to be creative and encourage self-expression. And so this included things like arts and crafts and uh, music therapy, listening to music, playing music. Um, Body-oriented groups included a relaxation group and psychomotor groups. So that was simple exercises, yoga, stretching, light aerobics. Um, so they saw how these activities affected each one of these clients, and I'm going to read a little bit out of the abstract. <clears throat> so the background, group therapies are routinely provided for patients with severe mental illness, which is what we're going to be doing when we go to South Strand. The factors important to the group experience of patients are still poorly understood and are rarely measured. To support further research and practice, we aim to develop a questionnaire that captures how patients experience groups within a community health context. So once these patients went and they took part in these activities, they would have a questionnaire at the end. And some of these questions included things like, I paid attention to what others said in the group. I understood the reasons for my behavior in the group. I met new and positive people in the group. Or things like, I hid my feelings from the group. I found it difficult to express my thoughts clearly in the group. It was hard for me to talk about my problems in the group. So they took all of these and they saw how each one of the mental illnesses reacted in each group. So in conclusion, 
The Ferrer group experiences scale, which is the group that did this, is conceptually derived and assesses dimensions of group experience that are theoretically and practically relevant. It is brief, easy to use, and has good psychometric properties. After further validation, the scale may be used for research into patient experiences across different group therapy modalities and for eventual uh, evaluation in routine care. So they were basically just talking about how <clears throat> group therapy is a great tool to use with mentally ill patients. And it goes pretty in depth into this. This was the, uh, the longer of the two, I believe. And uh, it's a really interesting read. But um, so how do these two things, how do these two articles come down to what I want to do as my activity for um, our day at Southstrand? So... Um, first, I love the idea of putting people into these groups and having the groups do different things. Um, so I thought it would be great to, um, depending on how many people there are, they said in the rubric that there was going to be about 15, but I'm assuming that can change. Um, and we can take the large group and break it into smaller groups. So if there's 15 people, like I said, we can break them up into groups of five, and we would take special consideration into making sure that there were patients who wanted to stay together or patients that didn't really enjoy um, being around each other, and we would break those groups up into groups of five, and each one of the other students, so myself and two others, or three others, or however many others want to participate in this, and we each have our own station. And at each station, you would rotate after, depending on how many we had, uh, about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so each station would have its own thing. So how the study had the group that was physical activity, the group that was doing the newspaper readings or the readings aloud, uh, the groups that did arts and crafts, each one of those would be a different type of activity. Um, so for my station, I wanted to come up with something that would be a little more on the fun side. So I thought about a board game, and I found this really great board game. Um, it, it was called Five Minute Dungeon, so it only takes five minutes to play, and you just, it's a cooperative game, and everyone kind of um, work together, you all, all the players work together to complete a common goal, and it's to complete this dungeon. So you'd flip these cards, and the players would have their hand with cards, and they would match the symbols on the card that got flipped with the cards in their hand. And once they played that out, they'd move on to the next part of the dungeon. Pretty easy, pretty simple. However, I don't know the cognitive level of the patients we're going to be dealing with, and I don't know if there's going to be patients that aren't going to be able to understand the rules very well. So I wanted to go with something a little simpler, and I haven't really decided yet, um, but I'm thinking something like Uno, uh, Go Fish, just something a little bit easier. And with these easier games, we're going to be able to sit there and have conversation, and it's going to be a less intensive game that we're going to be playing, and it's going to be a more relaxed setting, so we can sit there and play Uno, and we can talk, and maybe these patients who don't normally interact with each other find out that they're dealing with the same thing as the guy sitting across from them, the girl sitting across from them, that they wouldn't have known if they weren't doing these activities with us. Um, and so uh, other, other stations could include something like arts and crafts um, or like exercise, yoga, um, light aerobics. There's tons of opportunities for different different stations and I think that having them do these in short bursts would be really fun for them instead of sitting around doing the same thing for 45 minutes you know and I, like you said um, in the rubric uh, we need to make sure that they're entertained and if they're not entertained by playing Uno with me uh, I'm sure that they don't want to do that for 45 minutes and maybe they would benefit more from doing an arts and crafts station or doing some kind of physical activity. Um, so yeah, I think that, uh, 
I think this will be a really great clinical experience and I am really excited for it.